Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. This is some of my fun stuff. I, I love going into the history and things like that. Hidden history is absolutely wonderful. It really is, I think, probably my favorite stuff besides energy, you know, Qigong and things like that, as far as, you know, understanding how everything came to be. It is, and it's important to understand where how things came to be because how, how do you know where you're going in life if you don't know where you're from? That is a good point. Mm -hmm. That is a good point. Give that girl a gold star on the forehead. Yay. <laughs> yes. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at some depictions of the Sumerian gods. Interesting, is it not? So these figurines uh, are, in many cases, little household gods that people would have on an altar representing an entity, a being. Yeah, and I think they're gods and goddesses, aren't they? Yes, gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fascinating, you know, because in the Bible, there's a prohibition. Thou shalt have no graven images of that which is above or, you know, that which perhaps walks on the earth at times. Right. Yep. No graven images. Why? Hmm. Did, did you ever think to ask why? Well, you know, things in the ether can make changes and emotions can make changes. So... I guess if someone were to want complete control over everything, that's one of the things they'd want to control is um, emotion and ether. So Abraham, who is the founder from which really all the Abrahamic traditions come, which is obviously Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all come out of the Abrahamic tradition. Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees, which is what the Bible tells us. And so, well, where was Ur? Well, it's it's basically a modern day Iraq, and you got to wonder too. You know, what really is the cause of these the Iraq wars? And I have friends that were taking part, you know, that were soldiers, and and have shared with me that they went and were told to destroy a lot of religious relics. Yeah, and it's really sad. And of of course, there's deeper reasons behind that. And we see. Uh, groups like Al Qaeda, for instance, going and, and destroying religious relics as well, seems that there's always a cover up going on. You know, cover it up, cover it up, cover it up, because we can't let them know what the truth is. No, no. If 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 people knew the truth, they would lose all control. Well, I, I mean, it could shake things. You know, just like you know, if if aliens did land in mass and just presented themselves to us, would that mean the end of most of our religious traditions? I think it would mean a really harsh, sharp end to most religious traditions. But not all, because, you know, there are those, especially the indigenous people, that understand that there are different types of beings mm -hmm. in the world. Um, and while I'm thinking about that, can you grab the book that's right by the bed that I was reading last night? Um, it's by Richard Thompson, um, and I've read this a dozen times, but, you know, I, I just go into it and reread it again. So you got to put pieces together and question, you know, as we've said before, Buddha said, don't believe things because I tell you. Don't believe things because your parents tell you. Don't believe things because your teachers or priests tell you. You have to weigh it for yourself. Do your work. Use your mind. And then judge it also with your heart. Does it feel right? Or does it feel like perhaps it's not right? There are a lot of super interesting um, parts of the Bible where you just have to say, okay, but doesn't that mean something that it, we're taught is not really a fact or what have you? Doesn't that contradict something? And there are many people that will go ahead and there's been books written on trying to defend these contradictions and these little insights that perhaps give us a different view of what was really going on. So you see over here, and this is Exodus 20, and I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath. Hmm. You know, for one, it's just saying, okay, no other gods. Well, I, I thought there only is one God. And 
you know, that that's one of the things we should get right off the bat. It, but then we know, you know, when it talks about God, it's it's a plural. It's Elohim. Maybe you don't know, but if you're new to the channel, but if that's the case. Why not make an idol from anything that comes from the heavens above? Or maybe it comes out of the waters. And we remember Oans and Dagon that are these beings that uh, they're wearing like fish across their back and they come out of the water and they're revered as gods and they teach humanity. Um, and some have thought, well, maybe it's really mermen or merwomen or what have you. Maybe it's, you know, Atlanteans. Maybe they're representing Atlanteans and, and it's just to, you know, show that they come from somewhere else instead of making a picture of a boat and the guy's coming out of a boat. But then there's pictures of, you know, UFOs and spacecrafts and, and people flying them all throughout history, all throughout uh, medieval paintings, Renaissance paintings, going back to stone statues that go back thousands of years. So right, right off the bat, you know, that is interesting. It is curious. It gets you, you know, wondering. Uh, and this is Psalm 81.9. Hear, O my people, and I will warn you, O Israel, if you would listen to me. There must be no strange God among you, nor shall you bow to a foreign God. I am the Lord, your God. So again, it's saying there's more than one. It's saying there's a multitude of, of gods. And again, this is the original word is Elohim, which is again, plural. Now, when we look at some different translations, it even gets easier, even more interesting. Uh, Wycliffe version on Exodus 23, uh, verse 3, thou shall not have alien gods before me. You know, these are a lot of things that we just don't look closely enough Or if you, like I used to go to church and I used to try to make sense of this stuff. And um, it would get to the point where if I asked too many questions, somebody would say, well, you know, ultimately you just have blind faith. Just know that the this is the only God, the only creator. And after a while, when things just don't fit, they just don't fit. And, you know, defend it as much as, as some will do. It, it's really, you have to go back and look at the history. You have to understand that, as we said before, you know, what we've got as far as today's modern Abrahamic beliefs has been a system that's evolved and it's evolved over time. It's changed over time. There's been a lot of books omitted. There's been a lot of things destroyed, burned. You know, we could go way back to the Library of Alexandria and think about all that knowledge that was burned. There's so much that is hidden in the Vatican that they don't want to see him because, you know, all their gold and all the treasures they've amassed well, it might start to look like they were all about amassing treasures, amount, amassing gold, amassing power and control, and not really giving us the one true religion. And this doesn't mean that there isn't a God by any means. You know, There is a source of all, without a doubt. It, all traditions basically will adhere to that. Even the pantheistic uh, traditions will say, ultimately, they're all as one. And that's what we see in the mystery schools as well. Here you see a strange drawing found in the Sinai could undermine our entire idea of Judaism. And again, out of Judaism came Christianity and Islam, although they were influenced by other, you know, other lines of thought as time went on, being exposed to other people, uh, because, of course, there was a lot of trade going on. There always has been trade and travel and people bringing new ideas in. So... Oops, okay, well, it's very, very touchy, the computer here. So this is an interesting picture. Uh, I guess we got to read this PG-13 or something. Mm -hmm. um, but as we see, more than four decades after its excavation wound down, a small hill in the Sinai Desert continues to be devil archaeologists. The extraordinary discoveries made at, made at Kuntalet, Ar Ar <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong here, Ajrud, an otherwise nondescript slope in the northern Sinai, seem to undermine one of the foundations of Judaism as we know it. Then it seems that the Lord our God wasn't one God. He may have had even a wife, going by a completely unique portrait of the Jewish deity, 
that the archaeologists found at the site, which may well be the only existing depiction of, that stands for Yahweh. Um, so it got its name meaning an isolated hill on the water source from wells at the foot of the hill. It's a remote spot in the heart of the desert, far from any town or trade route. But for a short time, about 3,000 years ago, it served as a small way station. Dozens of drawings and inscriptions resembling nothing whatever found anywhere else in the region survive from that period, which seems to have lasted no longer than two or three decades. Egypt gained the artifacts with the peace treaty with Israel 25 years ago, but the release of the report on the excavation six years ago in a book about the site two years ago have kept the argument over the exceptional findings in the hill on the Sinai alive. And, you know, it's interesting, too, when you really go in deep, because uh, everything goes back to the Sumerians. That's the thing. It, all this, the Abrahamic tradition comes out of Sumeria and Akkadia. And so it, it all traces back to, you know, some very, very ancient stories like the Enuma Elish. And this hill lies 50 kilometers south of Kadesh Barnea and 15 kilometers west of the ancient Darb el Gaza route, which led from Gaza to the Red Sea's Gulf of Iliad. Its unique qualities were first noticed in 1870 by British explorer Edward Palmer, who discovered a fragment of a clay jar, a pithos marked with the Hebrew letter Aleph. Later in 1902, a Czech orientalist and explorer, Alois Musil, was attacked by local Bedouins who claimed that he was defile, defiling a holy site. Exploration would only resume in 1975, 73 years later, by the Tel Aviv University archaeologist Ze'ev Meshel as part of a collaboration between the university and the Israel Exploration Society. So the excava excavation showed that Kuntalat Ajrud was what's called a single layer site, meaning it had been occupied for just one period, which the excavators dated to the late 9th century or early 8th century BCE. And Meschel estimated that it had been occupied very briefly, 25 years at most. Structure wise, the excavators found two fairly simple, unimpressive structures. The wonder lay in the drawings and the inscriptions. And so we see at first archaeologists thought that the place was a military fortress. Other fortresses from the first temple period had been found in the Negev, but no evidence that there had been a military presence was found. And in the third excavation season, Meschel declared that the structures weren't that sort. So it was basically a place, you know, where people were occupied for a little while, but it's just so interesting. You see there's animal drawings there as well. But the big thing is that depiction of Yahweh mm -hmm. and his wife Asherah. And, you know, this is something that has definitely stirred uh, a lot of thought and a lot of controversy as we look at the location at where it would, has, has been found. So what are your thoughts then? Well, I think it's really important that we can get this information and look at it and pick it apart and decide for ourselves without the the threat of, oh, if you go against the Bible, you know, you're going to go to hell. I, I think all of these beliefs, all of these religions should be out in the open for people to look at and dissect as we so choose. Um, but there's just so many things that are hidden um, you know, if it wasn't for the Sumerian tablets, it, it would have been pretty difficult for me to wake up because it wasn't until I, I read them and started to understand them is when I realized, oh, okay, well, this is where all the stories from the Bible are coming in, and that's just not right. So it's good that this is out. Yeah, it most definitely is. As we see, you know, this is, this is the depiction right there. And you can see why they wouldn't want to have graven images if that's the image that they're going to be given. Uh, and so it, it's really fascinating to look at this. But when we study uh, the mythologies in a comparative fashion, you see that there's a repeating of the same stories over and over and over again. And the inscriptions are mostly in early Hebrew, with some in Phoenician as well. Many are religious in nature, invoking Yahweh, El, and Baal. 
and to include the phrases Yahweh of Samaria and his Asher, Asherah, and Yahweh of Teman and his Asherah. So there is a general agreement that Yahweh is being invoked in connection with Samaria, the capital of the kingdom of Israel, and Teman and Edom. This suggests that Yahweh had a temple in Samaria and raises question over the relationship between Yahweh and Kaos, the national god of Edom. Asherah was originally a goddess, her name eventually evolving in the biblical period into the designation of her cultic pole. But you know what's also interesting is Asherah becomes a demon in, in, uh, you know, as it evolved over time. Uh, you you have heard of um, Astaroth, right? And it, it's what happens is they demonize certain aspects. And again, uh, it became an extremely pa patriarchal religion where in the deep past, it was actually more balanced. And, you know, we've seen this shift because at one time, most societies were matriarchal. And then they turned patriarchal at different time periods as we entered a period of war, for instance, uh, domination of the energies of Mars, for sure. So this is just fascinating stuff. But, you know, we know that the Bible is taken from these older stories. So the Enuma Elish, which is also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, is the Mesopotamian creation myth, whose title is derived from the opening lines of the piece, When on High, All the Tablets, containing the myth found at Asher, Kish, and other libraries as well. They date back to about 1200 BCE, but they go, they're copies of something that's much older. Uh, and in this article, they're quoting 1750 BCE, and I've seen others say 2000 BC. So it, it's much, much, much older. Uh, if you look at the oldest complete copies we have of the Hebrew, um, Torah, it's actually like 9th century A.D., you know, and then also there's different authors that we see. There's, you know, basically uh, the Yahwist and the Yellowist, and then there's the priestly caste whose job was to translate it. So they used to do little jots and little tittles uh, to signify where the vowels go, but again, the vowels weren't put in there because vowels have power, and we've talked about that before. So, you know, when, what do we see with this? Well, we see that, you know, it, it talks about multi multitudes of different gods. And what else do we see? Well, we see that these gods change depending on where we find copies of this. Sometimes, you know, we see Marduk, for instance, uh, being the top god. But then there's other times that it's thought that the Enlil Enki saga, you know, those are the top ones. Anu is actually the top top. And it's interesting because it tended to be the case where the top god would be wherever, you know, the people were. So, and by that I mean that if you go back to the Sumerian line of thinking, each city-state had their own top god. They recognized that there were other gods, but each people had their own god their own individual God. And we've talked about this too with Deuteronomy 32 and how it's actually taken from the Sumerian writings. And it talks about God sitting amongst, you know, basically a council of the gods. And so it also talks about how they divided up the, the whole world in amongst themselves, each taking their own people. And some maybe a little bit more benevolent than others, some a little more malevolent than others. Some preferred, uh, you know, a gentle nudge. Others would send a plague, <laughs> you know. And so they each were different, and, you know, this is what we get. So who are these gods, really? And then what does this make Yahweh? Now, we, we do also, what's interesting, too, when we look at this story, uh, it goes in line with uh, a lot of the Gnostic thought, too, which is fascinating. It, there's just so much here that people are just so unaware of. And unfortunately, it, it enables them to be manipulated in so many ways. So, you know, here is Tablet 1. When the heavens above did not exist and earth beneath had not come into being, 
There was the Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and the Demiurge, Tiamat. So that is really interesting too. The Demiurge, Tiamat, because we have the Demiurge coming out of Gnostic line of thought, um, gave birth to them all. But see, that's the interesting part too, because they have the Demiurge being a feminine energy. And in the Gnostic line of thought, the, the Demiurge is more of a masculine line of energy. So we could look at here, Tiamat is yin, and over in the Gnostic, it's yang. So all interesting stuff, isn't it? It, it is really interesting, and I, I really wish that they would just start teaching this stuff in kindergarten. It's fascinating. Well, you know, it, we didn't have the full translations uh, until recently when they found the uh, Rosetta Stone, basically. And so it's interesting because you can look at it in many different ways as well. Um, but the bottom line is that there's different levels of these gods, these beings. And as we've talked about too, like if you're talking about the Demiurge, uh, you could almost look at it as like, I guess you could equate it to the master program of manifesting life on this planet. That's what you do. It's it's nothing necessarily good nor bad. It's what what kind of intent goes into it. And, you know, ultimately... Science and certain mystic traditions will tell you that this is all an illusion anyway. It's all a construct um, that has been created for us, a matrix of sorts. And again, we are being given a very, very limited frame of, of view, uh, a very limited mindset, and, and that's all about control. It's all about maintaining control. As we talked about modern Christianity stemming out of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, you know, Rome, you know, that's where it came from. And, you know, there's actually people that grow up thinking that Rome is the holy land, you know, and, and, and not, uh, you know, Israel or what was Canaan. And, you know, when, when we look at how this has been used to create strife and division amongst ourselves as well, you know, you're admonished at the end of the Bible to go out and spread the news and, you know, basically to convert people. And then, of course, when we have Islam, you know, there's also, you know, do not suffer an infidel to live, right? You have to go out and convert the whole world to Islam, and Islam means submission to submit. Um, so it's put on the course, you know, a collision course with each other. And then we've talked about Albert Pike, you know, in 1871, same year we got the Banking Act, saying there was going to be three world wars. And he even went into detail saying that, uh, the Third World War is going to be all about, you know, Islam basically being set up against Christianity and, and creating a mutual destruction and in order to bring about a new religious mindset, uh, which he actually called the full doctrine of Lucifer, by the way. But again, you know, it's, it's, and I keep seeing people that say, you know, on different places, and like Richie from Boston will say, they're all alien, uh, they're not aliens. He says they're all demons. You know, they're fallen yeah. angels. But one. what is a fallen angel? You know, because angel comes out of messenger. I'm going to really get into depth with that in another video, maybe even today, um, because, you know, the language has been used in such a way to give a limited perception of reality and an incorrect perception as well one that keeps us controllable manipulable well yeah you know a chaotic perception too you know confusing because you know if you think about it when you wake up in the day you say good morning you know and and it's just how they throw in those that word morning why why would they throw that in there and it's all throughout the english language for sure and so, you know, when we even look at this, we have to take into consideration, you know, these people that wrote these stories oops, uh, were basically, you know, they were growing up in this system. They were growing up in this system. So this is what they were taught as well. So we have to recognize that. And, you know, again, they were probably being controlled pretty damn obviously, just as we have been controlled. So, you know, this is how these things come into being. Now, again, there's so many truths that are, are universal truths that do come through. As we said, there's ultimately one source. 
Uh, but the big difference is when we look at this, it's externally worshiping. So when you look at the Abrahamic tradition, the way it's developed now uh, into this modern day, you are giving all power and all praise and everything to somebody else, to an external force, uh, to what we are believing is the ultimate creative power of the entire universe. Yet we see, you know, when we go back far enough, we see it was pretty much the same thing as all the other traditions. And, and you know, Yahweh had a consort, Asherah. So also, if we look at the Tao, the Tao will tell you in, in the Tao Te Ching, and I do believe it. Anything that could be named is not the ultimate source. Uh, it's another more limited version of source, as each one of us is a different, you know, a different aspect of source. Every single living creation has source within it. And that is just self-evident because if source, you know, the real God with the big G is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, it must be in its in everything that there is. It absolutely must. I mean, there's just so many things to pick apart um, to make sense of. And what I want mostly for people is for people to feel safe opening up their minds to different ideas. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to explore. Don't be afraid to wonder. Um, find your child again. So depending on where you were at, you know, that God would be the best and most powerful. You know, so as we see here, as Marduk, the champion of the younger gods in their war against Tiamat, is of Babylonian origin. The Sumerian, Ea Enki, or Enlil, is also thought to have played the major role in the original version of the story. Copy found that Asher has the god Asher in the main role, as was the custom of the cities of Mesopotamia. The god of each city was always considered the best and most powerful. So, you know, and that makes sense when we look at it that way and we go back and we rewrite, reread the Bible and, you know, it's God talking. I am the Lord, your God, yours, you, the, the Israelites, right, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not, not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything that comes out of the heavens or on the earth, or anything that comes up out of the water either. So, you know, no more hints, no more clues, uh, no more letting people know exactly, you know, who I am. And again, there must be no strange God among you, nor shall you bow to a foreign God or an alien God. Again, that, now it becomes clear because, you know, again, all this comes out of Sumeria, where each god, and each god was actually thought to reside when it was here on earth, inside its own temple. And what did they do? They brought the best of everything to that god. The the fairest maidens. And, and think about kingship again, too. Where does kingship come from? On high. From above, right? Above, out in the stars. <laughs> Other civilizations. It's given to humanity. And what did the kings have? You know, there was a tradition uh, amongst, you know, back in the old days that was pretty horrible. And when uh, a couple got married, the king could actually claim the right of the first night and take the bride and the king could go ahead and, you know, lay with the bride. And it's the same thing that went on with these beings as well. You know, the best maidens, not only that, but what about sacrifices and offerings? Well, I mean, it says in the Bible again, God smelt the flesh burning and was pleased. It smelt good to him. And we could also go to the Garden of Eden. That was the sound of the Lord walking. Where are you? Where are you? I mean, does not the omniscient creator of all know where somebody is? Know where everybody is at all times? Kind of like Santa Claus, right? You know, you've got to be good because otherwise Santa is not going to come to you, little boy or little girl. So we see how we've been controlled and we see how they've used this to keep us in a limited frame of mind. And again, it doesn't mean that you got to be atheists because there's other alternatives. You could recognize source lives within all. As when we go into so many of the Eastern traditions and the indigenous people's traditions, they recognize that. They also recognize different levels or dimensions of existence. So, you know, if we say, 
Well, you know, you're saying it's a fallen angel. What does that really mean? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's a spiritual being. Okay, well, we're all spiritual beings. So what you're really trying to say is a being that maybe operates on a different density. Is that a different vibrational frequency? Uh, that's what they're really trying to say. But again, they're given simple words, simple terms to keep their minds in a simple mindset. Yeah, I mean, it goes on and on and on all throughout too. But the big, biggest thing that they want mostly is to control our minds, control our thoughts, control how we behave, control our actions and our reactions and our state of mind. So I think it's just really important to understand that maybe you know what you've believed all of your life maybe that's not exactly the way things truly are maybe there is another a different way to believe and what i like to try to encourage people to do is look around you know get curious you know find the child within and you know, just yeah get curious and delve deep and do some com comparative studies as well instead of just taking you know, one version of a story. And so, you know, it, it's fascinating to look at all this and then kind of recognize exactly how we've been manipulated. And again, you know, Constantine, it's out of Constantine's Council of Nicaea and the following councils that came after that, that we got the Nicaean Creed. And yes, you know, we had the kind of revolution in a way with Martin Luther at first and, and then you know, the whole Reformation going on, but it's still the same sort of translation because they didn't go and they didn't, you know, they didn't even have copies of uh, the Nag Hammadi, for instance, uh, until, you know, the 20th century. So that they didn't have all these copies of the other Gospels, of which there was over 200 in, in, in circulation, and of so many other stories, you know, and translations and different uh, spiritual books that were just destroyed. They were just destroyed because they painted a different picture. There had to be one solid unified line of thinking in order to control the masses. And again, Constantine's empire was, was at danger of falling apart. And again, this is a man that had his wife and first son executed uh, because he, he was fearful of losing power. So is he a saint? No. Well, how about when we look at different versions of the Bible, you know, people always bring up, well, I only go by the King James. Well, look into King James and see, was he a saint too? No, <laughs> not at all. So again, you know, look into the history, look deep and, you know, decide for yourselves what's going on. And that's ultimately the most important thing is that you understand in your own heart how things are. But one thing I would recommend that I've done on my path is, keep my mind open enough to be able to change it because once you get locked into a belief system you kind of shut yourself down a little bit and it is very convoluted that's the other thing too things have been so twisted in so many ways um and it's done purposely to to get us just running in circles chasing our tails mm -hmm. you know that's that's what they want us to do is chase our tails so guys i want to thank everybody for your support over at uh, Patreon and on Ko-Fi as well. We couldn't do it without you guys uh, and your support. As always, keep your minds open. You know, keep your eyes on the sky as well. God bless and namaste. Namaste.